Um, first of all, it's, I think, the best collection of Canadian art of this period uh, in a private collection. So um, Hard House, now I'm never sure about this, whether it's public or private, because it's, you know, it's, a, it's a university, but um, it, it's one of the best collections of its size for that period. So the works in it will be familiar to people who have any knowledge of Canadian art at all. There will be some real, you know, uh, familiar pieces like Charles Comfort's um, Portrait of the Young Canadian, Carl Schaefer. You know, they've been illustrated so many times, so it's, it's interesting for people to actually see these uh, in, the, in the pigment. Um, it's also important, at least uh, this is what I've written about in the catalogue, uh, the collection was, uh, began at the same time as, the, as Canada's National School of uh, Landscape Painters was evolving. And also as it was growing, there was a, an increasing interest in writing the history of Canadian art, which had not been done. So the, that's why the two are kind of uh, go, going you know, simultaneously. And, and the other thing is that um, uh, a lot of the artists were also involved in as advisors to building the collection. So, you know, there, there are a lot of different reasons why this is, is an important collection and, and it's our heritage, really. Mm -hmm. I've included, I think, 40. Now, I'm not sure because not all of them go to all the different venues. They're requested for other exhibitions. Uh, so there's 40 in the exhibition and that's only a percentage of, of what you know, of, of the entire collection uh, from that period. Now this goes from 1920 to 1950, and obviously there are works from 1950 up to the, to the present. So just to give you an idea, but these are the, I think these are the plums of the collection. Well, any curator will choose for different reasons. Um, it, I had, a, I had a, a sort of a thesis in mind, which was the idea of um, why are these so important? What, what has made this collection so important over the years? And what, how do we know that? And one of the uh, look, things I looked at was um, how they had been in international exhibitions. They had been requested, uh, you know, there were loan requests for exhibitions that went abroad. And these are important because that way, when, when foreign critics wrote about these shows uh, or Canadian um, journalists wrote about or echoed back what foreign critics had said, this was a way of Canadians to uh, read about the art, their art, it, you know, came into the newspapers, you know, the popular press, so that people uh, became aware of Canadian art on the world stage. So this is very important. And a lot of these, the paintings that are, are included in this show uh, were involved in a number of important exhibitions at that time, in that time period. So uh, the British Empire exhibitions in 1924 and 1925. Uh, there was an exhibition organized by the um, American Federation of artists in 1930, which traveled all over the states, and then in 1938 the, uh, the Tate Gallery um, hosted an exhibition called The Century of Canadian Art, and in, in which borrowed 11 works of art from the not huge Hard House collection, so that kind of denuded <laughs> the walls of, the, of that art. So they were considered very important works of art even at the time. The exhibition is hung chronologically uh, according to acquisition date. So there will be works that were uh, pa painted in, say, 1925 that weren't acquired until 1929. So they'd, they'd be further on in the exhibition. I think it's important um, to realize when specific works of art, when specific artists were, were acquired, uh, because it may take, take institutions a while to realize the importance of a particular artist or a particular work of art, or you know, did they have the money at the time? So all of those, but uh, so it starts off in 1920, and then I, I take it up through uh, uh, 1950. Now the original uh, group of seven, as, as we all know, it was entirely male. Uh, so that, that first section is all uh, male, except for Emily Carr, who of course um, met with the group of seven in 1928 and, and was encouraged by Lauren Harris. So there's a piece of, Lord, of Emily Carr, and that's very nice to have here in Kelowna. Um, and then uh, you find with the, um, the, the dissolution of the Group of Seven and the founding of the Canadian Group of Painters, their successors in 1933, uh, you find more women artists because 
um, the, the Canadian group of painters was um, na nationwide. It wasn't focused in Toronto as the group of seven were. Uh, so you get a lot of, of uh, women artists. And m most of those artists were either painting in a similar style to the group of seven or they were in some way personally involved. Uh, they were wives or uh, friends, the Beaver Hill uh, uh, women in Montreal, for instance, uh, and Savage you know, being one, and, and others, they, uh, um, Prudence Heward, uh, they were you know, part of that group. And uh, some, of, some others were uh, invited as contributors to Group of Seven exhibitions in the 20s. So there, were always, there was always this peripheral group uh, but who weren't actually the, the, the founding members. But then you find more and more uh, women are involved. Well, I've, I've done a whole thesis on, <laughs> on, on Canada, not that specific question, but Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa in, this, in the period between the two world wars. So this, this is you know, part of this particular period and looking at the growth of the national visual culture in relation to Great Britain, because they were still, they were dominions, uh, but they were uh, culturally still dependent, I would say, on um, you know, the old post-colonial idea. They were still pretty dependent on the mother culture. Uh, Canada was a little different because of, of our proximity to uh, the United States. Whereas the other ones were a little bit more in the thrall of the mother country. So it was an interesting period to look at. Uh, but after the First World War, all of these countries were really kind of trying to carve out um, an individual identity for themselves in relation, you know, politically and in other ways as well. And um, this, had been, this had started before the, the war, of course, back in the, the late 19th century, they were talking about, you know, what makes Canadian art Canadian and so on. Um, but this was a, a, a right moment, so there were a lot of forces that were coming together um, in terms of, of current ways of thinking, philosophy, politics. It all sort of came together, and um, Canadian painting was identified as, you know, what, what, what speaks of Canada, uh, and it, it turned out to be this, this wilderness landscape uh, of the north and the north was often not very far north, and it was a, a, based on a regional idea of Canada. It certainly didn't represent BC or the Maritimes. It was very much, you know, uh, Algoma, Georgian Bay, and then, you know, they, they started to move around uh, over the years, but that was initially wilderness meant no people, so people were kind of eradicated. The human presence was eradicated from the landscape. Uh, but that came back in. People, people reappeared in the 1930s with, you know, sort of whole humanist movement and uh, social um, responsibility, I think, of the artists to kind of show what was happening mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh, how difficult people's lives were and, you know, trying to give it a more humanistic basis. Well, that's one of the important uh, features of this exhibition is that um, these works never hang on the walls of Hart House because Hart House still isn't climate controlled, and uh, there's always the, the danger of theft and vandalism. So these, these are kind of treasures, and they're kept in climate controlled storage until something like this, as you say, gives, gives uh, a, a, the opportunity of, of allowing people to, to appreciate it. Um, it's problematic um, for collecting institutions who don't have the space. So you either have to expand, you know, go into a, uh, a developmental phase and, and grow. Um, but it's very important to um, collect and keep the memory of creative activity of that period. So it, you know, it's important to collect. Um, but sure, if you if you would like me to to curate a uh, an exhibition of, of the Kelowna collection to travel around the country. I'd be happy to, uh, because you you know you find real treasures uh, that um, you know. With the internet, I think uh, a lot of institutions are putting their collections online, so you can see you know small thumbnails and click on and you know there it is. Uh, and the same with the Tom Thompson. Um, Catalogue Raisonné, which was, uh, I think it was last fall, it was um, put online. And that's a wonderful resource. 
Uh, now, it's not the same as looking at real works of art, but it does a service. You know, it, this is where these works are, and it's also a way of finding, um, hopefully, finding where disappeared works have gone because so, you know, something might twig, oh, well, you know, I've seen this somewhere, and you know, that's so that would complete the, the catalog. But I, yeah, I don't think there's any uh, substitute for looking at, at real works of art. <laughs>